All right, so today we're going to cover the basics of liberalism, um, starting off with its history and some of its fundamental qualities. We have got a text that we're going to use as a reference um, to help us get through what we want to cover. Um, you're not expected to be familiar with this text or to have read it. Um, we're just going to be drawing off it to help us cover what we're going through. So first we'll discuss liberalism and its key principles um, and historic significance in Western political thought, giving the kind of overview that you know one might expect to receive if you were to do some sort of basic political theory class. Um, then we're going to go and introduce Dominic Lacerdo's work, which is the text I was referring about just before. Um, that text is a counter history of liberalism. So we'll explore his insights into how liberalism has provided the ideological justification for settler colonialism, for genocide and for land theft. And then we will talk about the implications of his analysis for the struggles here in the Australian colony. Um, we will, in the next lessons, we will then analyze liberalism and how it can dilute radical movements and co-op the struggle for liberation. Um, after that, we're going to be looking at the second text, which is Combat Liberalism by Mao. And we will work through each point outlined by Mao and its significance for revolutionary movements and how, the, how these um, principles apply to the Australian context. We're then going to have a discussion about how liberalism and identity politics manifest within revolutionary organizations. And we'll talk about you know, ourselves here at the BPU, as well as you know, some of the other organizations that might come along to that class, um, as well as just the political scene more broadly across Australia and the ways in which you know, regressive liberal tendencies are persisting and hindering progress. And we'll also talk a bit about some of the strategies for unlearning so that we can, you know, move forward from liberalism. So to start off with, um, we'll go through a bit of an introduction to liberalism. So I suppose, you know, when we talk about liberalism, what do we mean when we're actually talking about it? The answer is twofold. Um, at first, we're going to talk about liberalism as a political and ph philosophical ideology and situate it in its historical context. And then we will discuss how liberalism manifests in behavior and thought in those next classes. So liberalism is a political and philosophical ideology that emerged back in the 17th and 18th centuries during the enlightenment period in Europe. Um, some people here may have heard of John Locke and I always mispronounce his name, it's Rousseau, Rousseau. Um, they're two of the better known liberal political philosophers. So liberalism as an ideology is characterized by several key principles. Um, these are the sort of things that you would learn about if you were to go and learn about um, liberalism. So in a historical context. So first off, we've got individual rights. So liberalism places a really strong emphasis on the protection of individual rights and individual liberties. Now, these rights typically include stuff like the freedom of speech, uh, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and as well as the right to own property, which is a very important one. So these are the primary rights that liberalism concerns itself with. Um, up next, we've got the limited government. So liberals advocate for a limited government that is constrained by a constitution or a set of laws. Um, the role of the government, according to liberalism, should be to protect individual rights, to maintain law and order, and provide essential public services. Now that government should not interfere excessively in the lives of individual citizens or in the functioning of the economy. Um, building on the economy, we've also got free market capitalism, which is another core principle of liberalism. So liberalism promotes free market capitalism, which in itself upholds private property ownership and economic competition. Uh, liberals argue that a competitive market encourages efficiency and innovation and that individual economic freedom is a good thing, but you know we'll explore how this is a contradiction as we go further along. Um, up next is the rule of law and equality under the law. So liberals believe in the rule of law where everyone, including government officials, are subject to and accountable under the law. This principle is meant to ensure that governments um, are fair and consistent and just in their actions. Um, and with equality of law, you know liberals supposedly advocate for equal treatment and protection under the law for all citizens, regardless of their background, their race, their religion, their social status, etc. And they oppose discrimination and support measures to ensure equal opportunities for all. And finally, we have secularism. So many liberal societies promote secularism, 
which is the separation of religion from government and public institutions. Um, this is to ensure that religious beliefs do not unduly influence government policies and decisions. So we will have a bit of a discussion at the end, but does anybody notice any contradictions here already? Yeah, we'll elaborate a bit more towards the end. Um, maybe. But yeah, you can't protect rights without power. That is very true. That is, you know, definitely a contradiction here. Um, there's also contradictions in, you know, when we look at what is written here and then we think about how liberal societies around the world have actually acted, um, you know, we see that it's not consistent with principles that they claim to uphold, at least not at a face level value, but we'll delve into this a bit more. But yeah, you know, ultimately, I suppose, to capitalism and equality under law contradictions as well. Um, but yeah, we'll discuss that a bit more as we go through. So up next, we've got the historical significance in Western political thought. So liberalism holds significant historical importance in Western political thought due to its profound influence on the development of modern democratic societies and the shaping of political and social structures. So I'll just give a quick recap for anyone who doesn't know. And, you know, again, this is just basic sort of um, entry level stuff into liberalism. But liberalism emerged during the Enlightenment period in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, thinkers such as John Locke, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Montesquieu laid the intellectual foundations for different liberal ideas. Um, these philosophers questioned the absolute authority of monarchs and aristocrats and advocated for the rights and freedoms of individuals. So it's important to remember here that at the time, Europe was largely dominated by absolute monarchies where rulers had unchecked power over everybody. So liberalism in this perspective, you know, represents a departure away from this system. It proposes an idea that individuals possess inherent rights and that the government should exist to protect these rights and not infringe upon them as it had been doing under monarchies. So liberal ideas, you know, um, play a pivotal role in various movements around the world. Um, these include the American Revolution back in 1775 to 83 and the French Revolution in 1789 to 99. Documents like the United States Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Rights of Citizens drew heavily from liberal principles, advocating for individual rights, liberty and equality. Um, liberalism was a driving force behind the establishment of democratic forms of government around the world. So constitutional democracies, where governments are limited by written constitutions that protect individual rights, became increasingly common in Western nations during the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, liberalism's emphasis on economic freedom and private property rights oh, pardon me, also contributed to the development of capitalist economic systems around the world. So the Industrial Revolution, which transformed economies in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, was fueled in part by liberal ideas about free market capitalism. In the 20th and 21st centuries, liberal democracy became a widely adopted form of government in Western countries and you know, beyond as well, not just in the West. So this is a funny one. The promotion of liberal values, including democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, has been a central tenet of international relations and diplomacy. And, you know, we see how that has worked out around the world and how that's currently operating. So liberal, liberalism defines not only our entire domestic political sphere, but most of our international political sphere as well, due to the United States being a superpower and the cultural domination of the Western world in general. It's hard for a lot of people to imagine concepts like justice and equality outside of liberalism. And that's in large part due to the heavy influence of anti-communism in Western thought. Now, the political ideology of liberalism stands in stark contrast to First Nations political ideology, pre-colonization, which was a form of proto-communism that had very you know, antithetical principles to liberalism with a strong emphasis on stuff like communal values and cooperation with communal gain and the centering of community as opposed to individualism and self-gain and the centering of one's own individual self. So the key features of liberalism that is threaded throughout is the notion of individualism. Now that's one of the most important parts of this to remember, the whole kind of basis for liberalism. So this is the feature that is the most prevalent in contemporary Western societies, 
and is one of the single biggest threats to revolutionary organizing. So we will discuss this in more detail a bit later on. But from the viewpoint of liberals, liberalism's influence in Western political systems is seen as a fundamental and a positive force that has shaped the principles of democracy and individual rights and the rule of law. Liberals would argue that liberalism has played a pivotal role in advancing human freedom and equality and prosperity, and you know that principles continue to be essential for the functioning of Western democracies. But from the viewpoint of, say, you know, revolutionary indigenous communists or anarchists, we might argue that liberalism, as an overarching ideological framework, has played a very dominant role in shaping Western political thought and Western political action by perpetuating things like colonialism and capitalism and other systems of exploitation and oppression that exist, you know, particularly ones against First Nations people and against our struggles for self-determination and liberation here. All right, so does anybody have any, you know, questions or comments on this slide before we move on? I suppose I just wanted to say specifically about, um, you talked about individual, the individualism nature of um, liberalism and how um, the term individual um, is like used in a really, really broad way, but also a really narrow way. So like, um, if it says it protects everyone's individual values or um, rights, they're not protecting Indigenous rights or First Nations rights. And so how that's a contradiction um, there that is widespread across the entire spectrum of you know, individuals, quote unquote. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's part of the whole contradiction of liberalism. Like you can't protect opposing rights equally at the end of the day if there's you know opposing interests sorry not necessarily rights but opposing interests you know and people try and place these as some sort of rights they come into contradiction and conflict with each other all righty we might move on to the next slide then Okay, so um, up next, we're going to be talking about the text, um, Liberalism, A Counter History. So Domenico Lacerdo um, was around, I think he was born in 1941, and he passed away in 2018. Uh, he was an Italian philosopher, a historian, and a political theorist known for his extensive work on political ideologies and history of ideas. So this text, Liberalism, A Counter History, is one of his most renowned works. It was published uh, back in 2005, um, and it takes a critical and historical look at liberalism's role in the context of power, domination, and oppression. So in the text, um, Lacerdo's central thesis challenges the traditional portrayal of liberalism as an unblemished champion of freedom and equality. He argues that liberalism's history is complex, it's dark, and it's marked by contradictions. So while liberalism claims to champion individual liberties and rights, it is associated with various forms of domination, including colonialism, racism, and capitalism. And, you know, as such class and social hierarchies as well, as Tali has also chucked in the chat. Um, so the key themes are colonialism and liberalism. Lesotho examines how liberalism was used to justify and rationalize European colonialism and imperialism. He explores the tension between liberalism's professed ideas of freedom and equality and the brutal realities of colonial expo exploitation and oppression across the world. Um, he also talks about class struggles and economic exploitation, um, talks about the role of liberalism in managing and perpetuating economic inequalities and class struggles. He critiques how liberal thought protects the interests of the capitalist class, um, while also downplaying and perpetuating the exploitation of the working class. Um, he goes into racism and exclusion, um, highlighting how liberalism's historical record includes complicity in racial discrimination and exclusionary practices, uh, particularly in the treatment of Indigenous populations and the institution of slavery. And it also covers universalism and particular, par, yeah. particularism. The book explores the tensions between liberalism's universalistic claims of rights and freedoms as well as its historical tendency to prioritise the rights of certain groups, while also denying those same rights to others. Um, he contends that liberals champion the rights of freedoms of a privileged few, 
while simultaneously engaging in the brutal subjugation of Indigenous people, of enslaved populations, and of marginalised communities. Um, this dual approach is what Lesotho refers to as paradoxical particularism. So we're going to go a bit more into exploring Lesotho's insights into how liberalism has provided ideological justification, justification for settler colonialism, for genocide, and for land theft. <clears throat> so in the text, Lesotho critically examines the historical record of liberalism and its role in justifying and perpetuating settler colonialism, genocide, and land theft. So first, um, we'll talk a bit about settler colonialism. So settler colonialism as a distinct form of colonialism represents a pivotal chapter in the history of Western expansionism. It's particularly concerning Indigenous people and their ancestral lands. So this multifaceted phenomenon, phenomenon involved the establishment of permanent settlements by foreign populations on territories that were already inhabited by Indigenous communities. It was you know, ultimately driven by a combination of imperial ambitions, economic interests, and a prevailing belief in the manifest destiny of Western powers. Um, Dominic Lacerdo's insights into how liberalism provided ideological justification for settler colonialism offer, oh, pardon me, offer profound insights into the mechanisms that enabled this expansion. <clears throat> Sorry, something in my phone. That enabled this expansion and the lasting consequences that it had on Indigenous people across the world. So at its core, settler colonialism is characterised by the deliberate and the long-term occupation of Indigenous lands by settlers of European descent. Now, unlike other forms of colonialism that sought to exploit overseas territories for the extraction of resources or labour, settler colonialism aims at establishing permanent settlements that would replace Indigenous societies. So European colonial powers, uh, you know, particularly during the age of exploration and conquest, viewed this expansion as a means of extending their influence and control over vast regions of the world. So as we've just talked about, you know, central to that liberal thought were the ideas of individual liberty, property rights, and limited government intervention. But it was precisely these principles that were selectively applied to legitimise settler colonialism. So, for example, you know, liberal ideals and property rights. Uh, Lesotho argues that liberalism's core principles, including property rights and individual freedoms, have been used to justify settler colonialism. Now, colonisers often frame their actions as the pursuit of economic development and economic progress, and they were asserting their right to acquire and settle on Indigenous lands using this claim of, you know, bettering the economy and bettering you know, progress and science and whatever else. Um, another big part that they applied of liberalism was this whole civilising mission where, you know, they had one key aspect of liberalism. The role was, you know, settlers, the settler colonialism idea of civilising missions, you know, where they would go out and they would find the uncivilised, you know, blackfellas out wherever else and, you know, go and, civilise them and make them better people because the way they were living was too primitive and too set back and savaged and uncivilised and whatever else. So in this way, liberalism positions the colonisers as agents of progress and agents of civilization. You know, framing this, framing it this way, you know, helps to justify that displacement and the domination of Indigenous communities because it's, you know, seen as being in the best interests of these Indigenous communities. Um, there was also the selective application of rights. So liberalism's emphasis on property rights often led to the selective application of different property rights to different groups. So colonizers claimed property rights for themselves while disregarding the historic land rights of indigenous populations, obviously. Um, this effect, uh, this approach, sorry, you know, effectively legitimized land theft, um, you know, using claims such as terra nullius which was another big key ideological construct employed by settlers and colonial powers. Um, you know, the notion that the lands were unoccupied and that nobody owned them, so they were free to claim for economic development. Yes, Darwin was a liberal as well. <clears throat> 
Yeah, that's a good comment as well, Freya, about, you know, like the working of the land being used as justification um, for, sorry, the lack of working of the land, I should say, being used as justification for it being unowned and, you know, free for economic development. But, you know, at the end of the day too, like, when we look at the context here in Australia, we see that that wasn't actually factually true. You know, we did work the land um, to quite a degree, especially in places like New South Wales. Um, along that eastern sea border. But, you know, of course, that history has been swept under the rug and denied, and, you know, we've been portrayed as hunter-gatherers and nothing more. So, you know, the justification for never working the land was also used here. All right, I so I might... all... yeah. Sorry, I was going to jump in and say, it always makes me smile a little bit that um, Burke and Wheels work, walked all the way to the Cape and back past all of the food in the world, like all of the food. There was so much food literally at their feet and they died of starvation. It just, it, that little bit of, you know, a <laughs> little bit of justice in some small way. Uh, yes. <laughs> hilarious. Hey, there's heaps of actual um, hilarious as fuck stories like that about, you know, people, you know, look, I'm not saying it's hilarious that they died, but like there's also hilarious stories where they didn't die as well. Like, you know, people, um, for example, up in New South Wales, there's a type of plant that we eat, but you have to wash it for several days in running water to extract the poisons out of it before you can eat it. Now, the early colonizers got off their boat starving. They didn't know about this process of washing it. They just saw us eating this plant and then they went and ripped a whole bunch off themselves started eating it you know fresh off the tree more or less and um all gave themselves the runs and whatever else all right let's get back into the class moving on to the next slide all right genocide um so lacerdo's central point um in the text is that liberalism's commitment to universal principles was also selectively applied um, creating a hierarchy of humanity that devalues certain groups so that others may prevail at their expense. So in the context of genocide, this selective application allowed for the justification of mass violence and murder against marginalised or oppressed populations. Now, liberal thinkers and colonial powers often perceive these groups as, you know, other, inferior or, you know, even as obstacles to their progress, making it easier for them to rationalise their extermination. Now, during the era of European colonialism, scientific racism gained a lot of prominence within liberal thought. There was pseudoscientific theories. Um, a lot of pseudoscientific theories developed to try and categorize different races and different you know, ethnicities hierarchically. Um, with European settlers, of course, you know, often positioned at the top of these hierarchies and you know, black people and indigenous people across the world being placed down the bottom of these pyramids and these hierarchies you know, alongside um, less evolved forms of life as they're referred to, you know, such as chimps and gorillas and whatever else. You know, it's quite an atrocious um, history when you actually go and look at it, you know, how they used to keep people in zoos and all. Pretty disgusting. But yes, um, so during the era of that European colonialism, um, <coughs> pardon me, um, Lesotho talks about, you know, how there was a historical instances where liberalism provided ideological cover for genocide. Um, he gives an example in colonization of the Americas, where liberal principles of property rights and of conquest were used to justify the extermination of indigenous populations there. Now, the infamous phrase terra nullius, you know, empty land, um, was employed to deny the humanity of indigenous people and their right to their ancestral lands of European imperialism in Africa liberal ideas were often invoked to justify brutal colonial practices. Now, the concept of the civilizing mission framed European colonial powers as a benevolent bringer of progress and of civilization to supposedly backward societies, which justified the exploitation and the violence inflicted upon indigenous African populations. The same is true here and, you know, the same is true in Federal Islands as well, um, South America, um, throughout Asia and elsewhere where they've gone and committed these colonial violences. So Lacerdo's work in this regard highlights how liberalism's 
ideals of progress, enlightenment, and civilization were employed to mask the violence and brutality of colonial conquest. Um, liberal rhetoric portrayed colonization as a noble mission, often obscuring the violence inflicted upon indigenous populations. Um, liberal ideologies also advocate for the assimilation of indigenous cultures into Western frameworks. This assimilation is seen as a means of bringing indigenous populations into the fold of civilization, but it involves erasing our distinct identities and cultures and traditions, um, knowledge, language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's also the liberal justification for colonialism um, included in claims of humanitarian intervention, such as suggesting that the colonizers were acting in the best interests of indigenous populations. You know, these narratives often delight the stark realities of exploitation and oppression, which is that, you know, we were living a lot happier, healthier lives before we were saved by civilization. You know, if you look at our health stats now compared to our health stats before colonization, and, you know, they're absolutely horrendous. And, you know, there might not be specific figures around to display this, but there is, you know, the figures from the early colonizers that, you know, refer to our age and, um, you know, our health, et cetera, et cetera. And there's also stuff we can look at such as, you know, our language. You know, a big one for our people today is suicide and self-harm. You know, we've got one of the world's highest rates of suicide 50, 60 years ago, you know, we had a next to nothing suicide rate. Before colonization, suicide was so rare here on the continent that most, if not all, Aboriginal languages didn't even have a word for it. Now, we've got very complex languages. We've got a lot more words in our languages than a lot of European languages do. You know, we've got how many words can you think of for mum, for example? You know, my language has something like 20 different words for mum depending on their relationship and how many kids she's got and rah, 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 a whole bunch of things. We didn't have a word for suicide. You know, there was no word for taking your own life. It was something that was completely foreign to us. But then now today, you look at our rates, um, you know, going off a bit of tension here, sorry. But yeah, we see that the humanitarian intervention argument is a massive lie and contradiction when we actually go into it. Moving on to the next slide, um, land theft and ideological dualism. So, you know, much of what we've just said about, uh, just before, sorry, for settler colonialism and genocide applies here. So, you know, I mean, fundamentally, we've got that selective application for property rights, as we mentioned earlier. Um, liberalism's emphasis on property rights frequently resulted in the selective application of these rights. Now, why colonizers assert their property rights over indigenous lands, um, indigenous communities are denied this same recognition and this same protection. And in fact, you know, we're often slaughtered and dispossessed of our lands and resources. So it was this economic interest that played a significant role in land theft. Natural resources, you know, such as minerals, fertile land, um, timber, et cetera, were often the target of colonial expansion, as we were just speaking about above. Um, and, you know, mob were often slaughtered and dispossessed for the land and its resources. So liberalism's promotion of economic development provided an ideological framework for this resource extraction. Um, ideological dualism, though, when we talk about that, what we're talking about uh, is the way Lusado emphasises it is a tension within liberalism between its univers universalistic claims of equality and freedom and its tendency to create and ideological dualism. So this dualism is ca categorized certain groups such as, um, you know, quite specifically indigenous populations, more or less when I say certain groups, as others or outsiders, um, justifying, you know, our differential treatment and the slaughter and genocide and the land theft that happens here. So, you know, we literally aren't seen as human in the liberal, liberal political ideology our inhumanity and their humanity are two sides of the same coin. And this is what we need to grasp when we try and understand what liberalism is. And like there's plenty of examples, you know, right throughout history where we see the way that, you know, colonized people and people who have been subjected to racism and capitalism and slavery and exploitation, et cetera, et cetera, you know, go and join in some sort of false class solidarity with their own oppressors to try and better their own selves individually. You know, as we're talking about before, that whole individualism aspect, um, we're actually going to 
incorporate that into one of the later classes on individualism, individualism as well. Uh, sorry, on liberalism as well. And you know, talk about some historical examples here in Australia, um, North America, and Africa, where they have you know taken a class of you know a minority, a racialized population, and they've put them into a position of power over the rest of their people and use them as effectively the weapons to enact colonialism and slavery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, a great example down here in Victoria is the native uh, trackers, you know, the black trackers. You know, a very disturbing fact about deaths in custody here in Australia is the very first recorded death in custody of a Aboriginal person happened down here in Victoria, and it was not at the hands of a white police officer, but at the hands of an Aboriginal tracker who had been employed by the white police to hunt down other mob. All right, so there are several implications for so-called leftists, you know, to consider here in Australia. Um, one of them, the first one, is revising the historical narrative. So Lesotho's work encourages a critical examination of historical narratives surrounding colonialism here in Australia. It calls for a revision of the often sanitised accounts of colonial history, um, sorry, of colonial history that have downplayed the violence, the exploitation and the dispossession that occurred under the banner of liberalism. Acknowledging the brutal aspects of colonialism is essential for understanding and addressing its lasting impact today. And much of Australia's violent colonial history is swept under the rug or it's outright denied in culture wars. Um, Australia still refuses to accept that genocide occurred here, despite the largest racial genocide in history happening here. You know, 98% of the population was wiped out here. Um, revising historical narratives involves us unlearning that colonial propaganda that we are exposed to in regards to Australia's history, and instead relearning the true history of this continent so that we can better understand how we arrived at our current situation and how that history continues to shape our present today. Um, up next is challenging liberal justifications. So Lesotho's analysis underscores how liberalism was employed as a justification for colonial practices in Australia. Um, this insight challenges the notion that liberalism is in inherently promotes justice and equality. It calls on activists and leftists in general to scrutinize the ways in which liberal rhetoric has been used to mask genocide and dispossession and land theft. And you know, it calls on activists and scholars and those on the left to disentangle themselves from liberal notions of equality and justice and to reassess what equality and justice actually look like in practice. Um, up next, we've got recognising Indigenous sovereignty. So a key implication of the Cerdo's analysis is the imperative to recognise and respect Indigenous sovereignty. Um, indigenous communities in Australia have long called for our land rights. You know, we've long been calling for self-determination and the acknowledgement of our unique cultural identities. Lesotho's work critiques how liberalism's role in colonialism highlights the importance of supporting these demands and working towards a more just and inclusive society rather than putting efforts into liberal pursuits of justice. Um, it also talks about intersectionality of struggles. Um, you know, it encourages an intersectional approach to the struggle against colonial legacies. It recognises that colonialism here in Australia is not only about land theft, but also intertwined with issues of race, class, and gender. Um, you know, we should all be trying to adopt an approach that addresses these intersecting forms of oppression and seeks justice on multiple fronts instead of just one. Um, it also talks about restitution, um, you know, restitution versus reconciliation. So his analysis prompts a re-evaluation of reconciliation efforts here in Australia. So, you know, while official apologies and symbolic gestures are to some degree important steps to some people and, you know, while they do help to, um, help to, you know, play their own role in healing and moving forward, they don't actually provide any substantial or tangible measures or outcomes. You know, these acts of reconciliation fail to address the impacts of colonialism because they don't address the primary contradictions here which is why they often have bipartisan support in Parliament as well. And, you know, which is why quite often we'll see the government trying to push reconciliation, um, even if it is an LNP dominant government. It's because, you know, they don't actually address the material conditions that we suffer under. Now, restitution, on the other hand, 
is talking about stuff like land back and stuff like economic reparations. It's talking about stuff like self-determination and, you know, most of all, it's our sovereignty and it's to remove all of those colonial barriers that prevent us from being able to enforce our sovereignty. Restitution is stuff like justice and restoration and equality, stuff that we don't see under reconciliation. Um, it also talks about educational reform. So it makes a critique of liberalism's role in colonialism and, you know, suggests the need for educational reforms. It calls for a more comprehensive and honest teaching of Australian history that includes the voices and perspectives of First Nations people here. Now, this education can obviously help to foster empathy and understanding among the broader population, as well as win, win people over to our side and, you know, create better alliances and solidarity amongst the working class in general. Which takes us on to our next point, um, solidarity and activism. So Lacerdo's analysis serves as a rallying, a rallying point for solidarity and activism. It reminds us that the struggle against colonial legacies is ongoing. It you know, didn't start 200 years ago and stop 200 years ago. It's still ongoing even to today. It calls for um, you know, the active participation of individuals and communities and organisations in fighting against this struggle. It calls on Australians to properly stand in solidarity with First Nations communities and support our demands for justice and self-determination and sovereignty. Um, you know, I suppose, you know, in conclusion, you could say it's an analysis of liberalism's role in colonialism, how colonialism holds significant implications for the ongoing struggle against the colonial legacy that is Australia and how we need to re-examine our history and you know we need to place better emphasis in the recognition of first nation sovereignty and encourage you know non-indigenous people to help us enforce our sovereignty and to you know support our sovereignty and to even come under our sovereignty and you know, ultimately it inspires a collective effort to confront and dismantle the enduring effects of colonialism here in australia all right um, one of the questions in the chat is you know, can we give a brief summary on why the BP rejects liberalism? You know, ultimately, if I was to try and summarise it in a few sentences, why we ultimately reject liberalism, it's because liberalism as an ideology is not one that is compatible with First Nations culture and First Nations governance systems. Now, liberalism is heavily focused on individualism, as we were discussing at the start there. That's the complete opposite to our culture. Our culture is very communal focus. It's very looking out for everybody and doing stuff in the interest of the entire community instead of in your own self-interest. That's one of the reasons we reject it. But I suppose ultimately as well, you know, part of the reason we reject it is because it's a manifestation of capitalism. And, you know, it helps manifest capitalism as well. They go hand in hand together. Now, we can't embrace liberalism and reject capitalism. It's an oxymoron. Now, capitalism is the fundamental force that is exploiting and oppressing First Nations people, as well as the entire working class here in Australia. That is the thing that we ultimately need to combat. It is, you know, the underlying problem that causes stuff like racism and that causes, you know, the housing crisis and that causes climate change and that causes pretty much every issue that we see wrong and that we identify as being wrong on the left. So we need to reject capitalism and we need to fight against that instead of you know 101 different issues but that's why we reject liberalism because liberalism enables capitalism and it encourages capitalism you know one of its core tenets is individualism and private property private property is fundamental to capitalism and it's again something that's very opposite to first nations culture and first nations governance we didn't have private property you know when i say private property i'm not talking about personal property um, i'm talking about property in the form of resources that are held by one person and worked by others and that one person who holds the ownership um, takes all the benefits and all the profits of that ownership um, but yeah I'm sorry I'm getting a bit off topic again um, yes yes definitely even if liberalism was applied equally we'll still have capitalism but the thing is, like, we know that capitalism can never have equality at the end of the day. The whole fundamental tenet to capitalism is exploitation of one person for the benefit of another. So that's why we have to reject liberalism outright. Yeah. Um, Freya, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Um, I was just, I was actually going to say a very similar point to you just at the end there. Um, 
Kieran, in terms of like liberalism being uh, uh, fundamental to capitalism in that it was the ideology that enabled the transition from feudal mode of production so prior to kind of mercantilism and capitalism, the, the way that stuff was made was through serfs. Um, and that was like a form of labor that could be exploited by the ruling class um, to, you know, create things. Um, but the transition away from that was a bunch of people getting rich outside of the realm of the king and being like, wait, we want power too. And therefore the transition from that, the divine right of kings into mercantilism and capitalism was underpinned by the ideology of liberalism which had to convince all of those serfs not to be with the king anymore to take the side of you know the glorious liberators who were going to make everything better um and in some ways they did i suppose um but in a lot of ways they made it worse too so um that idea of it kind of yeah being one and the same is like yeah because they're kind of almost like two parts of the same machine um, and so can't work independent of each other. And something to, I suppose, underpin that is it can't be changed. It can't be like made nicer or given a nicer form that allows it to kind of work with more humanist principles. It just can't. It's unfortunately ultimately flawed in that way. And that's why we have neoliberalism, which has a much shinier face than the, um, the previous uh, kind of governments will do nothing to help the poor uh, kind of liberalism um, and now it's we'll do some things um, usually at the hand of having to keep up with the Soviet Union during you know the 20th century but um, ultimately yeah liberalism was required to make that change to convince us to be with those you know um, robber barons I suppose those mercantile um, uh, uh, lords um, and therefore to change it, we have to become something better, something different, something that isn't liberalism. And yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. All great points. Um, yeah. Thanks for bringing up. And yeah, also, like, I just want to touch on something just for people who are a bit unsure. Um, you know, some people might have heard li the word liberalism thrown around and the word neoliberalism thrown around and be a bit, you know, unsure about the difference. Neo just means new, ultimately. It's just the way that liberalism has manifested itself in the 21st century those, you know, ideals from the 17th and 18th century, the way that they're applied to modern day, um, you know, post-industrial revolution societies as we currently live in. Does anybody have any other, you know, questions or discussion points or anything? Also, before anybody goes, um, in a fortnight, we will run the next section of this. It's going to be a lot more fun and interesting than this one. And this one, we just had to cover the basics and the history. It was a bit boring, I know. But in the next one, we're going to talk about how liberalism actually manifests itself in leftist circles today here in Australia. And, you know, touch on stuff like identity politics and, you know, how um, all that sort of stuff seeks to de-radicalise and de-revolutionise movements and, you know, break up movements and cause fight, fighting and infighting and factionalism and et cetera, et cetera, and ultimately plays into the role of the capitalists to make sure that, you know, their system continues to exist. I suppose I wanted to ask, Kieran, just for your yeah. personal opinion on what's something that, like, people who think they're revolutionary but are really liberal kind of tend to, like, what's a big kind of thing that often that is a sticking point for them or something you've found that's a big wall for a lot of people who want to be more revolutionary but are kind of stuck in liberalism um, kind of have to get over? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to how much they actually know about politics and ideologies and stuff. Because, look, at the end of the day, like, I don't mean to sound like one of those people preaching to go out and read theory and stuff. You know, I'm not doing that, and that's part of the reason why we want to do these classes. So, you know, not everybody has the means or the time or capacity to go out and read 101 different texts from, you know, authors whenever, however long ago, and trying to apply them to their modern day, you know, life. So that's what we're trying to do in the BPU by, you know, providing these classes where we can just summarise these texts for people and, like, talk about what they're actually talking about and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, yeah, I find education is a massive hurdle for the left 
people get bogged down in all these um, different toxic ideologies and they don't quite realize that they're bogged down in them. And it's so easy not to know that you are bogged down in them if you don't have that theoretical knowledge and understanding to realize in the first place. You know what I mean? Like if you don't know that you're doing something wrong, you don't know you're doing something wrong until you learn that it's wrong. So it's about trying to, for for us, um, for me particularly, and for, you know, us in the BPU, it's about trying to educate the left a bit better and, you know, give people a bit, a bit more better analysis. Mm -hmm. I also find that a big thing is that, and it ties into the whole education thing, right? People just look around at their society as it stands today and they react to that instead of taking an objective view to society. And because they do that, we end up seeing things where people think it's suddenly radical or revolutionary to, you know, start advocating for raising the age or for, you know, housing homeless people or feeding homeless people, et cetera, et cetera. These things aren't radical. They're not revolutionary. They're, in a, objectively speaking, you know, if you objectively look at it, everybody should have a house. Everybody should have food. You know what I mean? Little kids shouldn't be locked in cages, et cetera, et cetera. These in themselves shouldn't be radical and revolutionary cause. But because we live in such a right-wing, oppressive, exploitive society, simply saying something as basic as that is seen as radical and revolutionary. And people get tied down in what is essentially reforms and concessions, thinking that they're doing radical and revolutionary work, when ultimately they're not. They're just chipping away at a system. But for every chip they make into that system, it just goes and builds itself 10 times bigger. But yeah, I think that's a major problem. Everyone's, you know, lacking in that understanding and that, you know, ideology. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm lacking in heaps of ideological understanding myself. You know, it's I'm learning a lot as well, um, developing these classes and stuff, which is, you know, really handy as well for me. Um, but it's, yeah, you do, you ultimately you do legitimize the system by trying to reform it. And, but not only that, like at the end of the day, you cannot reform a system to an extent where you can achieve equality when that entire system is based on inequality. You know what I mean? Capitalism is based on financial and economic inequality. It cannot exist without that. If everybody was a capitalist, no one would be a worker, so no one could be a capitalist. You know what I mean? It simply doesn't work that way. You cannot have it that way. Um, also, just, yeah, so... Just to kind of wrap up as well about next class um, and about this class as well, we can still keep the discussion going after this, but just in case people do want to head off. Um, just wrapping up, you know, this was a very brief overview of liberalism as a political philosophy, and we just wanted to kind of give a kind of basic overview and go through the counter history of liberalism before our next class so that, you know, people have got a bit more fundamental understanding before we start to delve more into the depths of it. Um, in the next class, we are going to go further into talking about how liberalism and, you know, this political ideology has taken root and how it's fested inside a lot of us on the left, you know, both as individuals and as organisations, um, you know, how it does that in the first place, how it manifests its behaviour, um, how it manifests behaviour within organisations, um, how it's harming and hindering our organising processes. And we also want to talk through, you know, ways that we can work together to unlearn these regressive liberal tendencies that you know reside within quite a lot of us and within our organizations.